and what other housekeeping are there? That's it, I think. Um, we'll go over anything else at the end. There's a, there's a competition threaded throughout this uh, slideshow as well. Um, I think a few of you might might know the answers, but we'll start. We so this is this is us that we have to just do one thing, um, simply to restore a, a former traditional conifer plantation to a, a native a mixed native woodland. So just one thing, um, and when you look at some lovely pictures like that of hard knock forest then um, it doesn't seem like that great a task but as some of you will know a lot of it is kind of uh, in an in-between state with blocks of conifers um, yet to be harvested we've got clear felled areas you can see the brush down there we've got areas where um, all sorts of trees have seeded themselves in um, native trees and obviously from these parent trees, these conifers, the spruce and such like. Um, that's a very pleasant view and it actually shows that there's, um, there's a road across there. I'll just try um, a little laser point. So there's a road just going across there left to right and above the road there's the blocks of conifers to be harvested and below the road all these are naturally seeded native trees um, a lot of them birch which tend to come in uh, very rapidly and interestingly virtually none of them have been planted by us or any human hand uh, and there's a nice view of heart of fell which is in between the durden valley where we are uh, and um estelle so if you're on the top of Artifell, you can look down into Estale. Um, while we've got that slide on, I've just got a, a little bit of context and you can't see me reading my notes about this, which is amazing. Um, so we're looking at restoring, I guess ostensibly we call it an Atlantic oak wood, an oak dominated wood. And um, that's not, not the only habitat type that, that we have and will have here. Um, but that's a particularly rare type of woodland, um, rarer than tropical rainforest. It's a temperate rainforest. There's enough rain for it to be classified as a rainforest. And that in turn means it's got a very rich um, and important um, community of, of mosses and lichens, uh, which will certainly excite someone out there because I know David's a big moss man. Um, it's, it's very biodiverse in, in many, many ways. Um, partly because of oak trees um, harboring so much diversity of in insects and invertebrates and mosses and lichens. Um, another advantage of our site is that it will connect with other semi-natural ancient woodlands along the Duddon Valley, which is a beautiful valley. If you've never been to it, do, do go. Um, so it's reversing a little bit of the fragmentation of habitats which as well as habitat loss uh, is a big hit on our biodiversity um, having ever smaller and smaller pockets of, of habitat and even if that habitat's very high quality um, certain communities and populations um, struggle to spread and struggle to survive. Um, it's still a working forest, uh, it's still got um, timber to be removed from it um, but Forestry England are, are, are not planting any more um, trees there it's far from anything else it's it's a tricky site to extract timber from down down that valley um, on to our actual project it started in 2003 um, which was um, by uh, Dominic at the University of Leeds um, who is listening so I may be able to fill us in a bit more if we need to know anything back before I was involved. Um, we had a lot of support from uh, John Muir Trust volunteers, we've had a lot of support from obviously Forestry England and um, students and staff from the University of Leeds. Um, another few characteristics of the site, an incredibly high level of natural regen of native trees, we've got really good conditions for that. 
once you fell a block of conifers, there's, there's bare ground for trees to seed in and an excellent seed source up and down the Duddon Valley. And so we've got downy birch, various willow species, rowan, holly, oak, and even a bit of regen of juniper. Also high levels of regen of, of the conifers. Um, up here, there's a lot of scattered conifers, which most of which have since been removed. I'll go into that later. In the foreground are uh, the sort of birch dominated woodland. Um, what else? We have done some planting, some limited planting of broadleaf, ones that are either rare or would struggle to get there, things like aspen. Hawthorn, surprisingly rare in our, on our site. Hazel, uh, bird cherry, crab apple, things like that that we've bought or been or been given small amounts of to, to plant. Um, and another aspect, um, really helped by the connection with the University of Leeds, is the monitoring research we're able to do. Um, we've done a big study or, or repeated a study twice, ten years apart, really going right through the whole site. Um, looking at uh, the, the region, particularly of the native species, um, looking at ground flora, um, looking at the heights of the trees, so um, over time, and that's been incredibly useful. There's been one paper published on it already, and I can link people to that if they want to read it, and another one coming out. And this time, we last it was last summer we did it, summer 2019, accompanied by lots of midges, and some of you that are out there listening to this. Um, and we've added also um, started measurement of carbon uptake from native trees, which is surprisingly little work done on what carbon stories there is of native trees. Right. That's where we are, just north of the village of Seathwaite in the Duddon Valley. Um, brought an infinest down there. And zooming in a little bit, a Seathway, Newfield Inn, the most important part of Seathwaite there. Cockney Beck, and uh, up here, Hard Knock Pass and Rhinos Pass descend to Cockney Beck, and then the river and the road come past us. 630 hectares, about 1,000 football pitches. To put a bit of historical context on, these are the kind of oldest maps I could find of the closest area, and this is just showing that even by 1600, um, a lot of the woodland cover had been fragmented to the point where it, you know, it was identified um, in little pockets there, whereas <coughs> no one really knows how much of Britain was forested, but it was certainly you know, 50, 60, 70%, varying over time, but obviously the main impact being human ones. And there's a later map showing the fragments They've just drawn these little circles round. It's just nice to look at old maps. Uh, and an early abundant survey map showing there's Heart of Fell, so there's our site with pretty much zero tree cover. Eskdale seems to have retained more. And really showing a similar thing in a graph form. Um, and really dropping down until just after World War One, when we really realized we had almost used all our timber supplies up, uh, not just in the war, but obviously you can see from that graph steadily beforehand. Um, and that's when the Forestry Commission, <coughs> now known as Forestry England, or partly known as Forestry England started, and did a lot of work to regenerate forest cover. Um, and that's a map showing where we are now. It says 2008, but I actually looked up this morning forest research stats, and they're still quoting pretty much exactly the same. I think it's gone up to 19% woodland cover in Scotland. Um, and obviously, a lot of that is planted, plantation for our timber supplies, um, which even with the advent of, of the Forestry Commission, we still import so much timber. Um, I think we're the second largest timber importer in the world, so we could do a lot more of uh, uh, forestry for timber as well as for habitat reasons. And 
Europe's generally a lot better off in comparison. We're through that. Oh, here's the competition element. Whenever you see a yellow slide, time to have a think and identify the next slide. Just for fun, there's no prizes. Um, so make a note or a mental note. I better carry on looking at the time. <coughs> Here's a timeline for our site. And I guess similar to a lot of plantations, um, back in the 40s and 50s, um, we were trying to redress this balance and planting um, a lot of single species, fast growing softwood crops, which in our case, um, towards the end of the 1990s, they were being harvested and there was a decision as to whether to replant or whether that site was appropriate for it, which is where um, our project started. Because um, Dominic may tell us a bit more about this later, but uh, initially contacted them as to what their plans were for the site. And um, a series of, of meetings, the project started um, and grew. and uh, through a lot of volunteer work and hard work on Dom's part, um, there was work parties organised every year right through to 2018 when um, he got some funding and advertised the job which I ended up getting. Um, and how pleased was I, this is how pleased I was, to change jobs after 20 years of teaching, um, although I do enjoy teaching still. And just a couple of very early slides. I think that's Dom with the University of Leeds group. And this is an interesting slide. I, th I think Dom can correct me if I'm wrong that that was Scottish Rural University College. Anyway, a group of folk planting trees and we've just removed um, maybe seven or eight years later, those tree tubes, um, collected them, recycled or reused them, freed the trees. Um, as I say, I've been in the job over two years. And so being um, having three days a week to organize things, we've, we've been able to have a lot more work parties, um, a lot of lopping, a lot of sawing. It's very good exercise, hard graft. Um, here's a before and after. Sometimes a bit tricky to see what a difference you're making. And um, broadleaf trees don't show up as well when they're not in leaf, but there you go, we're, we're just basically removing lots of Sitka before and after. And the, the native trees are pretty much already there. Um, that's just to remind me <coughs> to say that uh, we have residentials and we will have them again. Let's have a bit of water while you look at that. In the local, one of our local farmer's neighbours camping barn, which is great. Oh, here we go. What's this one? <coughs> oh, I think that's the hardest one. But I can't give you too long on these. Uh, we've had a lot of local school groups come in, um, primary schools and high schools, especially Mellon School, have been coming for several years now, planting and a bit of lopping, <coughs> having a good day out, and visiting schools from the outdoor centre up the road, Hinning House. They're about to plant some willow sticks, looking which way around to put those cuttings in. And obviously a lot of it is about having fun. We've we've had quite into camera trapping. It's a good way to monitor, but also <coughs> we've got some extra ones for schools to adopt and set up, and they're just spreading out a few peanuts. And this is what you get if you ask them to look like you've asked them an intelligent question and they're thinking it's totally posed um but they're very willing if you ask them these things then you you can fit a lot of children in survival bags um that was a nice day there we go I'll give you a few seconds on that um the partnership with forestry england there's one of the forest craft team, Rob Jones, for some reason decided to demonstrate to children how to chop down a Sitka spruce using my leg, <coughs> even though we were surrounded by Sitka spruce. But if you know Rob, you'll know that's his style. It does mean that when he got his chainsaw out, I just stayed well away because <coughs> he came to do a few days 
chainsawing. Um, a little bit about the other activities aside from the lopping and the planting. That's an example, not a brilliant photograph, of a holly that's been browsed. <coughs> could be by deer or it could be probably by sheep. But either way, we have found out over the years that using some lopsick is a great way to get these holly um, to establish. Otherwise, they stay at kind of browsing height. And this is a bigger version of a brush hedge with some seedlings planted inside by Duke of Edinburgh Award Group from Finesse uh, College, who come most months. Um, that out looks like it's had some heavy browsing in the past, but um, the deer management goes on by Forestry England to keep the deer at a, a population where trees are getting away, but deer are you know, a mammal that should be living in our forest. So we do want them. And the, the forest is stock fenced rather than deer fenced. Uh, having said that, there's our one bit of deer fence that uh, Tasman and Craig and myself went around to check. Because that was a, planted about the same time the project started by Forestry England. And inside there is really pristine, lovely native forest. There's a technique. Um, basically, to kill a tree while it's still standing, which is a fantastic habitat as it rots and dies for, um, for woodpeckers, well, for invertebrates and woodpeckers, then if it, and it falls over and rots and it's a habitat for all kinds of fungi and more invertebrates. Only do that with trees that are in a safe place and, and obviously non-native ones. We started doing a little bit of seed collection and propagation. Oh, yes. Um, this is a new addition, uh, an important part of managing a forest. It's a video. Sorry for inflicting this on you. Oh, I've just got to change my pointer. Uh, the serious point to that being that obviously we do get ingress from sheep around our forest. Um, so the relationships with the local farmers is really important. And we just had uh, a relatively new tenant who, who went in um, and very skillfully got out pretty much all the remaining sheep. We, we did have up to 80 odd a couple of years ago. We're down to just a few now. And they do really enjoy nibbling our new trees, so that's important. And I guess the theme, I think, of the project is that, um, you know, you need to get on with people. You need to, I guess, negotiate makes it sound a bit too serious because it was very informal chat with, with the farmer that came to get our sheep out and um, worked really well. Two species to identify there. Distinctive leaf. And back talking a little bit about what the University of Leeds have um, been doing. Oh no, first of all, photo, point photo posts before we get onto the monitoring. So we come back to the same point years apart and see it's a good visual way of seeing how progress is being made. And that's got quite high elevation, that one, about 300 meters plus, no planting, just heather and willow coming back on its own. And this is a, a nice sequence of three going way back, all from the same point. And uh, again, that's mostly birch, willow that grow back so quickly. But I think that shows what nature will do if you give it some breathing space. Um, and last summer's monitoring, we had various teams of people, some of our volunteers and some people from the University of Leeds. Um, Callum did a lot of the organising, and there's, there's Dom having a little sit down. Um, but it's two weeks solid work just monitoring all these trees. 
first Callum, I, I had to hold the camera and take take photographs of this sequence. And uh, normally everyone laughs at that and uh, I point out that we never saw him again and everyone feels guilty. Obviously, the previous time the study was done, you could step over those trees 10 years before. And there's some of the findings. Um, I guess a lot of it what you'd expect, but the the fact that you're getting 300 stems per hectare, that's 100 meters square throughout the site, um, from native region without any um, planting. I can come back to that later, but we'll just crack on in 2020. There's Tasman and Craig, who started with us uh, this year. Very lucky to have them. Tasman's done a chainsaw qualification. There's doing a bit of sawing in the snow. And also, um, because she's a physical geography, I think, and geology graduate, really good at digital mapping. And that corresponds with what we've planted and what we've lopped this year. Um, and there's, oh, I've just had a message from Zoom saying they've, we don't have a 40 minute time limit. Right, we'll still press on. There's Rob again. Um, and we were building some um, little enclosures to, to plant aspen in there. Um, so, which is great because I certainly wouldn't be able to do that when it was just me. And Tasman and Craig got brilliant practical skills. Uh, and Rob was there as well. No, Rob's great as well. Uh, early part of this year, just before lockdown, um, we've been planning for a, a good while to um to do a re-wetting project um where there'd been some drainage it was a fairly common practice in the early days of forestry to to drain areas to drain the boggy upland areas to make it better for planting trees um and policy changed um, in fact shortly after this area had been planted a lot of the trees um, were were removed straight away as, as forestry commission policy changed um, Obviously, the peat bogs are, are, are rare and a valuable habitat as woodland. And if you start planting them and dry them out, they do um, start to release carbon. And apart from that, they're a fantastic habitat. So um, with, with help from Forestry England, I just basically wrote to everybody and got them to do the work. There's Joe and Michael from Forestry England and, and John's local contractor and digger driver. I think this is a video. Yeah, here we go. John at work. And I'll tell you what, he absolutely loved his work, the John. Myself and Craig went up to see him, <clears throat> and I met him earlier, and he was just full of enthusiasm. Um, yeah, so he's in the right job. And almost straight away, you could see the water backing up and creating these pools, which um, look really natural already. And we went back literally days later, and there's already a, a frog spawn in there, which I thought was fantastic. Um, and again, with the expertise uh, and funding, part of funding from Forestry England, we're looking at removing some of these larger blocks of conifers that are, are not going to be suitable for timber. Um, they're self-seeded, a lot of this stuff, and it doesn't grow good quality timber. This is the view from the bottom-ish of Rhinos Pass. So you've got a kind of hard line um, there where our boundary is, um, which kind of looks quite, quite uh, artificial. Whereas you know, the, the broadleaf that's coming in is more patchy because it's seeding itself and it suits the landscape better. So those are the three areas which we have which we propose to fail using um, teams of chainsaw contractors. The trees are just too big for volunteers to take out with hand tools. So the, the green area or much of the green area and the yellow area have been done and we kind of ran up against uh, COVID and bird nesting season and the, and the red area is still to be done. So that's the top area 
um, that's the map that Joe did to show to the contractors. So most of that was completed before lockdown. And there they are. They quite like the work as well, but they had a tough job because the weather was pretty rough while they were there. And they get the chainsaws in. It's not the easiest job because we don't just want them foul, we want them to not grow back. So everything has to be cut down to ground level. And that is a fantastic example of how it's done, um, which you can imagine um, it's not easy to, to operate a chainsaw that close to the ground without getting your, your chain caught and filthy. And so they did a fantastic job. Um, mention of our sponsors. Um, we've been kept going largely the past 18 months by the North Face, very generously gave us the, we were the first UK recipients of their Explore Fund. Did that through EOCA. Forestry England are supporters in kind and with the projects that you've just seen. The United Bank of Carbon funded us and little bits of money from other people that you can see there. And part of my job is to keep chasing funds, which I'm doing in a minute. And I thought we'd finish with some nice wildlife shots, which is kind of what it's all about, I think, re recreating habitats somewhere enjoyable for us to go to, uh, as well as all these creatures. These are all off our camera traps. I won't even identify them. You can just imagine if they're tricky ones like that. I'm sure a lot of you will know them. We can talk about them in a minute. And as I say, they're pretty much all from our remote camera traps, which we just set up and, and leave out. So that one wasn't, that was by one of our volunteers on his phone. Little video section here. I'll have a close look at that before I play. Some of you might have spotted a bird called the woodcock in the foreground, but it's interesting what happens when you play that. Auto bombing Robin. Okay, so nearly done. Um, so the summary is really that a lot of what we do is working with with the natural processes, um, benefiting from the Duddon Valley having established woodlands. Um, but particularly having that J there, um, they're known for for storing, burying thousands of acorns um, every year in autumn to keep them going through the leaner times of winter and spring. Um, but of course they, you know, if they uh, bury thousands of them, they don't get them all and that becomes the next generation of oak, which in turn will start to produce their own acorns, which will bring in more jays. And that, that I think is known as a virtuous circle. Of course, we have to do some management uh, of the the non-native trees, um, which would be very successful and very prevalent if we didn't remove them. Don't usually remove them like that. And also that, is, that symbolizes that it's actually really good fun to do it. Um, you meet great people, you get to go to a beautiful place and enjoy what we do. And that's just, wait, we're waiting for the new field in to open. <coughs> And if you're not subscribed already to the newsletter, then that's the best way to to keep in touch or or just write to me. I'll put you on. Right, let me just see if I can unshare that.
and I'll unmute you. Right, right, you're 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 back. Um, now there's twenty odd of us, so I don't know how well this will work, but um, we can start off by people can call out what animals they think they saw, whatever you want, really. Um, a lot of people are still muted. I'm sorry, I've tried to. You must have muted yourselves, guys, or you've snuck off halfway through. Um, but anyway, here we've got. Ollie, I want to know what you think about it all. <laughs> can't, can't hear you, actually. I don't know what's going on here, folks. Sorry. Hang on. There we go. Can hey. you hear me now? I can hear you now, Ollie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> excellent, excellent. I, I knew I knew you'd, uh, you'd you'd ask for my opinion on it. Um, I think it's really interesting. I've known that valley for a long time. Um, when I left home when I was seventeen, um, one of my first jobs was to go into the Duddon Valley into Hardknot and to look for Dendroxinus beetles in the Sitka spruce that was growing there. Yeah. So um, it's always been a magical place for me, and. Uh, and I'm aware of you know your project, and I think it's a good thing. Um, I'm also very pro timber production, and uh, as you know, um, but I think everything has its place, and I think that valley too has its place. And uh, and I think what you're doing is good. I, I like it, and I like your presentation as well. Um, well thanks, Ali. Uh, just in case people don't realise why I just picked on you, it's because. Ollie is, is a forester, um, a beet forester at Forestry England, who I share an office with. He doesn't cover our bit, but um, I've learned a lot from people like Ollie um, and, and Joe, who's his counterpart that I do work with more, about productive forestry and about how it's changed over the years. And, uh, you know, that it's not um, the monocultural... Um, timber plantations that perhaps we're used to now in the future you know it is going to be integrating broadleaf and and for example aspen is being looked at isn't it as a as a productive tree which i think is a win-win um but I, I also feel lucky that we've got our project because of the geography of where it is as, as much as, as anything we're able to actually have that luxury of allowing natural processes to kind of take take court to, to play out really which is quite Cer unusual certainly and I, and I and I'm also very interested in your project because uh, over you just alluded to the fact uh, earlier in your presentation that in the neighboring valley we have Estale and uh, so I'm managing my Tadale. yes and uh, in Eskdale there's a lot of ancient semi-natural woodland and a lot of the oak there is, is it's an absolute magical place and i'm doing my best to convert the uh the pores the plantations on woodland sites in the ancient semi natural woodland part of the forest into what it was um with the oak and the birch and um and i'm very conscious too of the genetics involved in that as well i don't want to import uh, in the process, I don't want to even import um, alien genetics into that equation. I'd like to capture the acorns from the from the genetics that are already there, uh, and to carry on that uh, that process. So, um, so yeah, it, it really does. It, it's a it's a good project that you're involved in, and it's one that I'd like to mimic over in uh, my Tadale as well. Yeah, well, it's definitely scope for us having a few chats about that when we're both back in the office, Ollie. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Is there, has anyone um, else got any any questions? Did anything? Did I skate over anything, or do you want to ask anything um, that I didn't cover? Hi, John. Hi. Is that you, David? You've just lit up. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, 
I'm good. I'm good. I'll, I'll just say, just I'll just say who you are, like David, if that's else. all right, because um, not everybody knows you. Um, but David uh, is, a, well, ostensibly a botanist, but anyway, you work for Natural England, David, and did a fantastic job today, seemingly inviting all of Natural England staff to get in touch with me today. <laughs> and... Um, come and listen to me talk so I was getting all these emails from people that I know are, are real experts in their fields and thinking oh great um, but anyway so go for it David don't ask me about moss please oh okay <laughs> now I was just gonna ask uh, could you say a bit more about like the research Leeds Uni is doing on the site I was wondering just to outline that a bit more I thought that sounded quite interesting uh, it, it is, yeah, it's interesting. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the basics, but um, Dom is here who started it. Oh, he's muted at the minute. So, um, but, but Dom started the project and conducted the research, really, and, and Callum, one of his PhD students. Um, but we, we repeated um, and tried to follow, I don't know, 15 or so long transects throughout the forest. Um, with kind of uh, vegetation survey quadrats uh, intermittent <laughs> intervals along these transects, um, measured trees, counted trees, the larger trees, and we're now doing um, for carbon uptake. Um, and really, I was kind of I, I was a bit of a helper on that. So, Dom, did you want to add anything else about? The findings, or about what point we're at with that, um, the paper that's that's coming out, at some point. Yeah, I can do. Can everyone hear me? I can. Yes. Yeah. Um, nodding, yeah. Yeah. What, we were interested in just finding out how quickly the the native forest recovers, really. So, you know, after after the the plantations clear felled, how rapidly does natural regeneration happen? What are the kind of processes that control where natural regeneration happens and where it doesn't? Um, what are the rates of regeneration? How fast do the trees grow? Those sorts of like really basic questions that there hadn't really been that much work done on kind of natural regeneration as a process of, of, of creating new woodlands, surprisingly. Um, and so we did some work back in 2008, did a load of surveys across the forest. And then as John was saying, repeated those all last year. And the main finding was really that you, natural regeneration can create um, sapling densities up to 3,000 or, or more saplings per hectare. So as high as you, you would plant a new site. Um, and so, so it can be a really effective way of, of producing new woodland quite rapidly. And we often found it within two to three years after um, it, well, you get those sorts of densities. So I think in that way, it was a really positive bit of work showing that it can be a really effective way of producing new woodland. Um, I think we found that it was quite successful in, in Dudden for two reasons. One, there's a lot of native seed source around, so that's really needed. And second, I think the clear fell process really kickstarts the, the regeneration process because when the, the forest is clear felled, it, it totally turns up the soil. And because there's no um, ground flora underneath the spruce, then you have a really bare earth that the seeds get into really really well and that kind of really starts off that that regeneration process yeah thanks thanks dom that gave my voice a rest as well i've just been having a little look at any uh, anything in the chat and jillian i think jillian has asked about when volunteering can start again because jillian's one of uh, like a lot of you has been has been to help um I was in touch with the volunteer coordinator for the whole region for Forestry England because it's it's their land, so we go along with what them as well as the University of Leeds says. And she sounded hopeful, but I haven't got a date is the answer to that one. But obviously, everything's changing, uh, you know, on a daily basis. But um, soon as I find out, there'll be emails pinging out to everyone and. Um, and a lot, we had a very busy spring planned. We had, I think, about three or four residentials. We had youth groups. We had our regular volunteer uh, activities and just low and all sorts of groups that are all still really keen to, to come back. So I'm hoping that we'll start to 
get some of those in by before the end of the year. And this and and I had a quite a few talks as well. I'd never really thought about doing one online because not just because we've had to cancel things, but because uh, some of you, are, you know, not even in Britain, I believe some of you that are watching us now. So think about that. Um, and it's it's a remote place to get to. Um, you know, perhaps some of you would would like to volunteer, but um, the next best thing is to, you know, come and have a chat about it and see what's happening. I can't see any, anything. I'm getting let <laughs> off really lightly with these questions. I can't see anything in here. But thanks for support from various people from Natural England who hopefully we can follow up chats with various people about the Dunbar. Yeah, I've got a question for you. Who's that? Yes, hello Nigel. Hi, um, where did you get Aspen from? Where, where did you get the source of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we got some through Forestry England and I'm trying to remember which nursery they said it was. Um, and some through the Aspen project that back from the brink are doing, uh, probably heard of them which I believe came from a nursery in, in Galloway. So we, uh, like back from the brink there, we're, you know, we're looking out for a local seed source from, from trees that we think you know, may not be planted. Um, there's one on a crag quite near Wallabarra Farm. If you know of any others, do, do let us know. But I think there's quite a competition to look for local aspen seeds. So we'll probably all converge on the same uh, tree. Um, and there are some examples within the forest already that are thriving, um, even you know with deer and sheep around it. I suspect they were planted back uh, probably just before our project started anyway, because there are little patches of native planting that Forestry Commission will have done. So yeah, not as local I guess as we'd like. I don't know if, if that was kind of what you were wondering. We haven't cracked yeah. Yeah, given the fact you're collecting seed now to propagate, it's interesting that it's that sort of dilemma. Yeah, I mean, so far we've basically collected acorns from great wood, which is the, the old bit of oak wood within Hard Knot. Um, and so I've got a couple of trays of those outside. But no, it's, it's a tricky one, local provenance. We kind of, I guess, as an ideal, we'd, we'd do everything locally, but we're we're, we're just trying little bits really, but yeah. But it'd be interesting to see what it looks like when the aspen we have planted comes in. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful tree. Uh, John, hi, it's uh, uh, Chris Kagan here. Hi uh, Chris. I work, for, I work for Natural England. I had a great experience <coughs> just over a year ago. A bunch of friends and I were cycling through the Lake District we started around Lindale, we were camping on friend's land. We'd done a big long cycle ride, toiled up um, rhinos. And it was, you, we had this great experience where you come up rhinos where it's all you know, relatively bare and then drop down into Dunnerdale. And just the difference once you get into Dunnerdale with all the trees were in blossom, it looked absolutely fantastic, really. And all the, there was ten, about ten, 10 guys who were in there and all of us, went wow 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 yeah. one one after another as we came over the top into Dunnerdale and uh, it was just really great to see that just how much more vibrant the landscape was as you came down into Dunnerdale um so next time I do that I'll be able to look out presumably just over to the right there and 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 see what you're doing that'll be that'll enhance my cycle all the more yeah so thank yeah, you for no, that but you're absolutely right I think that's important to have that sort of wow factor because um, it, it's kind of easy to get a bit technical about um, projects like ours, but really, it's all for for me because it's, it's it's going to be a really nice place to be, um, and there's mm. nothing finer than walking through, you know, some interesting, um, varied, and preferably sort of old woodland. We just did some bird surveying, and uh, the the area known as Great Wood, which is probably a formally managed as a sort of as a oak plantation but um there's some really you know hundreds of year old oak in there and we were looking right into a, a woodpecker nest um 
with the adults going back and forth, feeding the juvenile, and just all these little nooks and crannies, pied flycatcher nest, um, loads more species than um, than I would have thought. Having, I guess, go there, do the work, lead the volunteer day, and then go home. But um, with, I guess, with the lockdown, um, when I have been in there, sort of on my own or with one or two others, um, you can appreciate it properly, which I think, you know, that mm. it's probably what it's all about, really. Yeah. And my question for you, John, was going to be, um, what, uh, what sort of thought are you giving to the Lake District World Heritage Site in deciding what you do as part of your project? Um, well, nothing that, the honest answer is very little at the moment. Um, it, we are in a bit of a bubble. I'm aware of this. We're kind of, we've got, you know, great, great partnership with Forestry England. Um, it's a relatively simple partnership on, unlike other projects, which have maybe got several landowners and, and interests. So, um, but um, in terms of the heritage site, nothing specific, um, but all the time we're kind of reaching out and getting more and more contacts with um, people from the national park and other sort of local landowners. And so I, I guess it's it's building out from a small scale, which I feel mm -hmm. sort of comfortable with doing, you know. And for me, the the positives we've got with um, some of the local national trust farming tenants and the na national some of the national trust staff, there's I think <laughs> a lot of potential in the Dudden Valley itself, which none of which is really answering your question, but um, it would be nice to, I guess, uh, maybe through just meetings like this or, uh, or, or some other forum, you know, to be, to be involved at a wider landscape level because there's so much talk about landscape level conservation or rewilding or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. to it does feel like the time's right because it feels like, anyone we contact or anyone I contact, it's like pushing at an open door. They want to know about it or they're doing John. something similar. Can you hear me, John? Yes, hi, Margaret. Hello, John. Very, very interesting, thank you. Um, is there, the, these remarks just now make me think, is there an outcome in sight? Is there a plan for the eventuality? The thought that the land belongs to the Forestry Commission never yeah. struck me before. So perhaps this is the time to start thinking about um, throwing out ideas and, uh, and building possibilities for the future, for the land to become subsumed into, uh, into more public ownership, perhaps. I mean, are you, in, are you expecting in 20 years' time to have way marked walks etc or is it going to be left as a wild space can, i mean can, can i just interject there margaret sorry hello um, it's nice to very nice to have heard your comments about the forestry commission i just have to say that the forestry commission was the enemy for me 50 years ago but it has changed its ways <laughs> so nice yes, to no meet no I, I just wanted to interject in that uh, you were suggesting that it should go into public ownership. I just it wanted to obvious. remind everybody that the Forestry England is in public yes. ownership. Indeed. I meant more yeah. local ownership. That, that, oh, that. Right. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when you start, I guess when you start getting into, into that, then that, that would almost be another whole role for someone that... Um, it is. Yeah, certainly I... I wouldn't be able to you know take that on but i mean ollie's quite right in terms of it is publicly owned and, and for what we've got now it works so well we've got a very secure partnership um you know sure. with Forestry England, you know kind of both formally and informally um so it's a it's a it's a very and and you know practically as well what's happening on that site is kind of uh, the, the right thing for that site um, but I, I, but not that I disagree with you that you know we we can't be looking beyond that and more ambitiously all the time. Um, and I guess it's that's great to hear these um, bits of feedback as well from people um, that I guess not um, stuck in the day to day stuff like like I am. But yeah, 
who knows? Well, what? Just one final comment, and then I'll shut up. Is that twenty years goes very quickly? That's my experience, <laughs> and in twenty years' time, I just wonder where everything will be. The trees will be twenty years on, uh, but the use of it mm. will will have to be thought about within that period, won't it? Um, yeah, I mean, we're always thinking more i guess visually and ecologically what things will be like in 20 years time because through going back this spring um even i guess i mean i've been doing the job for two years but volunteering for several years before that and just seeing the progress in that amount of time is amazing um, so and for the 20 years that will be you know an incredibly varied biodiverse habitat and it will only carry on because you can't um, you know, what we need kind of now it is more older, larger, more established forests, but we we, we can't just magic them. So um, it's yeah. and slowing down to, to the speed of those natural processes um, is important, I think, in general. Um, albeit um, having looked at those um, fixed point photography sites, it's actually quite rapid with with species like birch that you get you know you get a bit of forest back yeah, yeah thank you margaret good to see you thanks Tim. bye have you, another question for you, john have you got any disease worries any disease sort of um control issues anything to do with sort of disease i guess yeah, well, um, the things like the the larch are regularly inspected by um, by Joe the forester, and he and you know he's instructed us to keep an eye on things. We haven't got much to speak of in the way of ash trees anyway. It's just not species for that um, for the area. So, but the, the the few we have, which generally seem to be just around the car park, look like they've they've got dieback for sure um everywhere. but i don't know is there anything specific that you're thinking of nigel i mean we we haven't we haven't spotted anything other than keeping an eye out on the larch really uh, no nothing in particular but i guess once you get a high higher density of oak is there any concerns there you know i guess it's a, a natural process disease too yeah i mean this is it i suppose um if there was something that yeah um like the oak moth i can't remember its name or the that did affect it that would be that would be an interesting question because at the moment we are allowing natural processes to take take course and um as i've mentioned you know dead wood dying wood dying trees are all valuable in their own right so i don't feel personally concerned um about that I, could, I should add that to our faqs that i'm going to put on the website um but no no let nature take its course as 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 much as we can as much as we do and i think maybe it's an interesting point how um oak dominated the woodland will be in the future i mean the the monitoring that we've done so far shows that the regeneration at the moment is really dominated by birch rowan and willow make up about 80 percent of the regenerating saplings and oak is a pretty small percentage at the moment it's about between five and ten percent um how that would change over time I'm, I'm not sure and then there's a lot of questions about whether you know would you want to accelerate that transition towards an oak dominated woodland or not or, or would the would, would the woodland naturally not be that oak dominated if, mm. um, if you just let it completely um progress naturally and maybe oak woodlands oak dominated woodlands may have been um, um that that might be a, a, a kind of an artifact of yeah. human management potentially well certainly i mean we can't predict um things like climate and disease how will that affect things in the future but equally even within that site we're i've talked about you know about atlantic oak woodland but you know we're not suggesting or expecting that to be the case on the whole 630 hectare site it goes up to 500 meters or so so you'll have areas where it'll be dominated by 
by different species. We've not quite got a sort of montane zone, but obviously higher up, you'll get a sort of scrubbier areas, you'll get willow. It'd be nice to have things, things like, um, like dwarf willow and dwarf birch. That's something that I've got at the back of my mind, you know, potentially to bring into that area. Mm -hmm. um, that I've been talking to people about, speculating. There is, there is dwarf oak, of course, in Keskerdale in Newlands, uh, at presumably about the same altitude, I would think. And that those are yeah. very ancient forests, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you would get you would get little stunted specimens of all sorts. I mean, I've seen when I was doing some survey work in Scotland, I've seen Scots pine seedlings at about seven hundred meters. I mean they wouldn't you know they wouldn't grow into a huge full size Scots pine but it's twenty hours. I'm just checking my messages but otherwise we can we can give it five minutes and then oh I have got some <laughs> I've got some questions. Someone say something while I read this. <laughs> um Yes, the car park. The car park's open. People have been visiting. Oh, Dom's answered that one. <laughs> yeah. I was going to maybe ask um, what everyone's opinion is on how much planting you think a project like this should be doing, and or how much it should just be let kind of natural processes totally dominate, and you shouldn't try to tinker with it at all. How much time have you got? <laughs> um, We've got all night because the, these meetings are. <laughs> <not like five laughs> I'm, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. But I'm talking about the process. Um, so yeah, how much time have you got? Uh, the whole natural process, if you wanted it to come to its climax, could take two hundred years. Um, this whole project is an artificial project it's an artificial process um it's not quite as artificial as plowing up the uplands and planting sitka spruce uh, but it is however artificial um if you wanted it to be completely natural there would be no involvement whatsoever uh the climax species would probably take two to three hundred years to evolve uh so i'm not being facetious I'm just suggesting how long do you want to achieve? What goal are you looking to achieve? Um, well, yeah, the, the goal is really a forest composed of native species. And it is quite as pretty much as general as, as that, really. Um, but it's interesting to, to think, Ollie, as to what a forest would look like. Um, you know, there was there had been a plantation that obviously broadleaves and natives will seed into it. I mean, along this kind of spectrum, if you say a project like ours, ours is trying to be pretty purely native species, albeit I take your point about that we're interfering, managing. Um, and at the other end of it, you know, perhaps a pure plantation. And then I think increasingly we'll find that there's a lot of room for things in between, productive and non-productive, broadleaf and conifer. But it'd be interesting to speculate as to what our site would look like if we really did step back and, and let this kind of future natural that some people talk about take place. Um, I think what we'd see is um, initially a swamp of willow yeah. and birch and then the successor species coming through um so it would take a lot longer to evolve um you won't be seeing the oak uh quite as readily available as it will be due to your project which would be a bad thing in my opinion um i like to see the oak established earlier um but yeah it's all relative really is the point that I'm just trying to make. Yeah. Um, and then we've also got climate change yeah. and things are going to heat up and these species that were native and are native aren't going to be as native 
in another 100, 200 years' time. Um, you know, we like to think about doing the right thing for the next generation, but really in a, you know, in a native woodland context, we are looking at probably three or four, five, six generations' time. Um, just trying to give a bit of, you know, context to the whole scenario. Yeah, yeah. I knew you. I knew you would do that, Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I thought. I thought Dominic's comment about the uh, birch dominating and just just allowing that to unfold is quite interesting. Um, I mean, inevitably, you you're interfering all the way along, aren't you? Even if you step back, because you're probably stopping sheep going in and stuff like this, which and you're managing deer populations and everything around the wood will impinge upon the wood. So it's kind of a false thing that you can never do. You can never not do nothing, I don't think. I think we're always destined to do something. But I, I thought that was an interesting point you made, Dom, there about just seeing how the oak developed around that birch. And, and whether it did, you know, whether the oak does then come back to what extent, you know, that, that's quite an interesting question. Obviously, we may never see it because it might be a long time down the road as well. Yeah. And we can see, we can see the beginnings of it. We can see in all kinds of little court nooks and crannies in the site, oak saplings that, you know, where we haven't been, that presumably those jays are, are you know, are planting for us. Um, <laughs> But equally, we have been given 3,000 oak trees uh, by one of Ollie's colleagues, Joe, because they, you know, the, the Forest Commission plant a lot of broadleaf, and when they get to the end of a contract, we often do get some free trees, which we tend not to say no to. Because apart from anything else, people like to plant trees. It's nice to give them another task other than lopping down and sowing. Um, I mean, a few thousand trees a year. Well, I guess we've planted about 3,000 trees in the, each year, that, the last two years, and probably not as many as that before. So it, it's a kind of drop in the ocean, but it's things like enrichment planting, and enrichment species that uh, aren't represented in the site or, or down the valley. But I guess, it, I mean, a lot of it is educated guesswork, which makes it exciting, I think, you know. We've not got an exact blueprint, um, but we're enjoying seeing what happens. Yeah, to put that 3,000 number in context, our monitoring showed there's about 1.8 million regenerated trees on the site. Wow. So it gives you a sort of sense of scale of between what we're planting and what's coming in naturally. Yeah, we will continue that monitoring um, when we're when we're all allowed back in at some point, Don, won't we? And follow up on that. So, well, thank you to everyone. Is there anyone that's not spoken that's kind of uh, feel feels left out? Because <laughs> otherwise, um, hello. Tonight. Uh, hi, it's hi, Julia. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm another Natural England person. Apologies if you've been swamped by us. I think you guys have done yourselves proud, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a fantastic project. I um, work right at the north end of Cumbria, and actually I'm a southerner, but um, I hadn't ever heard of your project. So brilliant, fabulous. Um, I would like to come and visit at some point. I actually live quite near to Carafran. Um, oh, very know, good, yeah, been there. Heard of that. Yeah, Slightly yeah. sort of different in nature, but um, again, another site that I walk into and it just makes me feel amazing. So um, I think your yeah. project has sort of some similarities there. What, what, so, can I just ask a slightly tedious question though, just to finish off? Um, you can maybe lift the mood afterwards, but um, I do. <laughs> I'm really uh, looking I, forward to this. I, I do um, <laughs> work in the top end of Cumbria as well, where of course um, there's the back of Keel de Forest um, and and all of the timber production that you know is is as a result of that very sizable forest. Um, I only work on the Cumbria side, I should say. So um, I'm quite interested to hear um, about the fact that when this project started, obviously 
forestry England, as they are now called, um, were very keen on board um, uh, and still are, you know, great. W in your opinion, though, because times are now changed and the pressure for timber production has shifted and trying to get even more, you know, um, plantation area in the ground, do, do, do you think that actually this project would have got off the ground in current times? Because my experience at the moment is very much that, you know, every sort of conifer is um, a necessity, um, which of course it is in some regards, but in some areas it would be nice to link up other areas of broadleaves and things like that. And actually it's very difficult to argue the case for not replanting with conifers. Um, and uh, so I, I understand the, the pressures, the targets for timber, but, but you seem to have um, managed with this project to do a sterling job of finding a, a site where um, you've managed that very successfully. Um, so it was just a little bit more around the kind of, how did you do that? <laughs> how did that happen? Because I feel like in the current climate, that might be quite hard. Um, I think our site has got some specific, I get specifically its, its geography means that it was never going to be an economic site to replant because when you when you do if and when you do visit the valley you'll you'll see that timber extraction along the roads that we have there is just really difficult they have to be loaded onto small trucks they go over a bridge which has already been damaged by timber trucks and then they have to load them up at the end of the valley onto a larger truck so it's all very costly okay. so how well that translates i don't know because i don't think i personally have got a broad enough experience of of forestry and and other sites and as i said earlier we're kind of in a in quite a nice bubble with with our site mm. and the specific mm -hmm. circumstances um don probably able to tell you a bit more about how the initial <coughs> kind of contact went but i think we were in the right place at the right time or don was um on a, on a site that the uh, Forestry Commission didn't really know exactly what the best thing to do with it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and as, again, as I said earlier, I think, I hope, and I think forestry is broadening out um, its remit. I think we need a lot more productive forestry and a, and a lot more projects like ours, just a lot more of all of it. Yeah. That, that's, I can't be more specific than that, except to carry on doing what, you know, what my role is, but, um, I don't know if Dom or, or Ollie wanted to add anything to that. Well, uh, I wouldn't mind. Um, I'm only here just out of personal interest, really. I'm not a spokesperson for Forestry England in any uh, remit yeah. tonight. Um, but everything John said tonight um, is quite right. You know, it is a remote valley, uh, steep sided. Um, it's awkward to harvest. Um, it just lends itself to a project such as, that John's involved mm -hmm. in at the moment. Um, I would like to sort of counter that with the fact, and it is a fact, that it does grow incredibly good timber. Um, I'm, like I said before, involved in managing Mitredale, and the timber over in Mitredale the Sitka spruce is incredible, it's some of the best timber uh, in the UK. Colleagues come over from Kielder, they can't believe how fine the Sitka spruce is growing there. Uh, it's in its native um, sort of uh, area, uh, mm -hmm. west coast of uh, British Columbia. Um, mm -hmm. It just wants to grow, it wants to lock up carbon. Um, so from that aspect, it would lend itself to being a productive forest. But everything that John said, uh, the locality, the difficulties of harvesting the site, uh, you'd need cable cranes as opposed to conventional harvesting equipment, um, small lanes, so you'd be getting wagons in and out of there. Um, it probably does lend itself to being handed over to a project that John's mm -hmm. and Joe's been involved in. Um, why 
has John been so lucky to be able to take the project? And uh, I think it was right place, right time. Um, and I can't, I can't really comment for Forestry England. I really can't. I'm only here, just like I said, just out of personal yeah. interest. Um, and, and yeah, I can only say it, the right place, right time, and uh, and it's it's just for those reasons, really. And yeah. and going forwards with climate change, um, it, it is going to be an area where Sitka spruce is going to retain its ground as well. Um, if if it was to be planted, so it would continue to be a very good species to plant um, going forward. But mm -hmm. a project like this, you know, the 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 oak woodland that we've got over in Mitredale, it's unique, and it's one that I want to preserve. And if it's mimicked over in uh, over at Hardknot as well, I'm all for that uh, because we haven't got enough of that type of woodland either. So uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but it, it, it really is a great project and I, and I love it. Well, it's yeah. really good to have yeah, yeah. your perspective on it, Ollie. And I'd like to have a tour of Mitredale with you at some point um, when we're all back to normal. And like you said, well, about bringing, bringing a few of your colleagues over to Hardknot as well. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're trying all sorts at the moment. I'm trying to preserve the genetics of the oak woodlands over in Mitredale. And we attempted to plant some acorns last year uh, and put a tube immediately over them. Anyway, they haven't been successful, but we are putting plastic tubes over anything that does come through to save them from the sheep grazing. Uh, but I'm also conscious that plastic tubes aren't the way forward as well. So uh, I'd really love to have a discussion about how we continue the genetics of the oak that are native to that area and how we protect them. Um, so that, that I would really relish that opportunity. We could have another hour just on plastic tubes if you like. And <laughs> <laughs> except I'm I could do it. I could do it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll plan another one in a few months, but just the plastic tubing and see how many people turn up. If you mean you <laughs> We we are actually I don't know if you can hear me now. We are actually yeah. trialing uh, spraying sheep wool fat on regeneration, and believe it or not, sheep do not like eating their sheep wool fat. So it seems mm. to be working quite well. That's brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think yeah when the best thing we've been able to do is actually just get at least a couple of our neighboring farmers to be so helpful that they'll remove sheep when they come in uh, and we spent quite a bit of time repairing the fences or not me this is the royal way my staff <laughs> my staff who seem to have left the meeting <laughs> Tasman and craig have, have, have been incredibly uh, working incredibly hard and uh, made a big difference so it's all flowing along nicely. We're pretty happy. Hey, Tom. Just saying hello to Tom down there. He's just all right. All right, you've got a good time. Um, I'm right. going now, night night. Thanks, everyone. I feel like I should, you know, be able to say some kind of pithy little summing up, but I, I can't. But you're all very welcome to come along. Uh, hopefully not before too much time has passed, we'll be able to get back in there with some volunteering. Or just a guided tour, I'm happy to do that. We had a few of those booked, you know. If you, if you don't feel you can commit to a full day of, of uh, lopping or planting, then you can touch. And if you've not signed up for the newsletter, do that because... Um, I'll keep you informed. So I thank